What I should like you to witness is a somewhat strange, but let me emphasize it once, true story. Now, we all know that it is uh, somewhat dangerous to present a true story. One never knows who might be in the audience. A policeman, for example, a public prosecutor, or even a custodian of the television code, though not necessarily in an official capacity. Yet actually, there is very little danger, for they will refuse to accept the story as true. O officially, at least, and they will refuse to accept it as such. Even if, in reality, um, unofficially, so to speak, everyone knows all my stories are true. Anyway, I hope you will enjoy it. I know I shall. The Golden Age of Television presents Ernie Kovacs in Author at Work, co-starring Henry Jones, after these messages. You're about to see and hear some real value news from Ford. Taurus presents Author at Work. I have the honor to be in the presence of the world-famous poet, Maximilian Frederick Krupp. What the devil are you doing here? How did you get in this room? Your secretary permitted me to enter. I have been waiting in the antechamber for more than an hour. Who are you? Saint-Étienne. Honoré Saint-Étienne. You look vaguely familiar. Possibly. I'm almost certain I've seen you someplace. Most probably. Are you that persistent creature who's been bombarding me with letters for the past few weeks? Correct. Uh, Ever since you arrived here in Interlaken in this uh, magnificent hotel, I have tried to contact you. No success. Every morning, I ask for you at the desk. Equally unsuccessful. Finally, I lay in wait for your secretary. A very strange young man. This is a student of theology. Aha. Uh -huh. It uh, required a great many patient explanations to convince him that our meeting would be of great mutual advantage. Revered Maestro. Mr. Crobb. Revered Mr. Crobb. Hand me that bottle of rye. Oh, gladly. No, 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 the uh, other one. Thank you. Care for a drink? Uh, I'd rather not. Scotch, absinthe, vodka? I'd rather not. Uh -huh. Teetotaler? Uh, mainly careful. Uh. After all, I am in the presence of a literary giant, a titan. Mm. In a way, I feel a little as St. George must have felt before his struggle with the dragon. I'm very thirsty. I had too much to drink last night. With your permission. May I have a look at the room where the poet works? Author. Oh, where the author works. Books, manuscripts, photographs, more books. And the view? Absolutely superb. The lake with the Alps as a backdrop. The ever-changing clouds, the sun just going down, blood red. Overpowering. Do you write? I read. I read your books. Bill stares at Frank, who is almost ready to breathe his last. Horrible, rasping sound, shot in the guts. Death rather complicated. The troopers return. Bill thinks of the girl. Well, I'll be. I've been quoting from your novel report on the death of a young girl. I dare say you've been reading my book most carefully. Teacher by profession? A bookkeeper. Retired bookkeeper of the firm De La Rue and Shapiro. Uh, Locust, near Roulet. Sit down. Much obliged. A very luxurious apartment. Priced accordingly. I can well believe it. Interlocking is very expensive. For me, it is almost too much, although I live in a very modest place. Adelboden was a lot cheaper. Adelboden? Adelboden. It was an Adelboden. I know. You stayed at the Grand Hotel. I lived at the hostel. I knew from the first I'd seen you somewhere before. And once in Baden-Baden, 
You were in Baden-Baden? Yes. While, uh, while I was in Baden-Baden? While you were in Baden-Baden. My time is limited. My rather extravagant way of life requires a great deal of money. I must work like a beaver, monsieur. Uh, Saint-Etienne. saint etienne Honoré, saint, saint etienne Yes, of course. If you came up here to make a touch, oh. money is one of the things I cannot spare. Revered my straw. Uh, Mr. Croft. Revered Mr. Croft. But I didn't come to make a touch. I have become a detective. A detective? A private detective. Thank you. Um, let us sit down again. Oh, thank you. First, get me that bottle dry. Gladly. You see, as a bookkeeper, I found a great many things to investigate. Oh, the glass. And, uh, well, yes, uh, and uh, once, due to my efforts, the city treasurer was indicted for fraud. He actually went to prison. So, after my wife, may she rest in peace, died, uh, after a happy though childless marriage, I decided to pursue my avocation full time. I decided this mainly because I had read every single one of your books. Because of my books? Correct. And what branch of criminal investigation was your specialty? Was it uh, espionage, adultery, drugs? No. Uh, well, not white slavery. The literary branch. You became a critic? Oh, let me explain. Get out! No, 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 no. I examined your novels from a criminological point of view. Only revered maestro. Uh, Mr. Crabbe. Revered Mr. Crabbe, I was searching reality for the actual bases of the murders mentioned in your books. You read my novels as if they were police reports. Correct. Like reports of murders. Well, I found that your heroes murder neither for gain nor out of passion, but for the pure psychological pleasure of it, out of a love for life, out of a compulsion to experience new thrills. <laughs> well, when I made this discovery, I felt a little like the Spanish nobleman. <laughs> Don, uh, Don Quixote. Don Quixote. He set out on his travels because he believed the tales of knightly valor to be true. I set out on my task because I regarded your novels as true and nothing would deter me. I I vowed, no matter what the obstacles, forward. Forward. That was my motto. Excellent. Excellent. Absolutely great. Sebastian! Sebastian! You called, Mr. Crumb? Uh, yes, we, um, we shall have to work all night. But, Mr. Crumb, you told me that I could have the evening off. Off? My thesis about the Christian martyrs awaits completion. Theology can wait. Certainly, Mr. Crabbe. Uh, Sebastian, fetch Monsieur Sinetti and the cigar. Oh, if you don't mind, I'd rather smoke my own uh, uh, stogie from the uh, Certainly. Leave us, Sebastian. Light? Thank you. Enjoy your cigar, Monsieur Sinetti, and enjoy it. And do proceed with your discourse. I'm most anxious to learn the result of your investigation. Well, I began with an analysis of your novel, Encounter in a Foreign Land. Mm. My first novel. Published 11 years ago. Yes, I received the bowling prize for it. Hitchcock made it into a film. Color. All I can say, a masterpiece. An Austrian adventurer. Powerful, sun-tanned, bearded, a good-for-nothing, but genial, a heavy drinker. Ah, oh, yes, uh, uh, meets a lady, something high class, the wife of a Swedish attaché. He lures her into a dilapidated hotel in Ankara, a dive of the worst sort, and seduces her. Then he tells her, powerful, eloquent, convincing in his drunkenness, in words worthy of a Homer, a Shakespeare, that the pinnacle of ecstasy is to be found only in a dual suicide. The lady, drugged by the wild passion she has experienced, deceived by his, his wild eloquence, takes her own life. He doesn't kill himself. He lights a cigarette and walks out of the hotel. 
he roams the dark, sinister streets of Ankara, assaults a preacher in a Turkish mission, empties the poor box, and at the crack of dawn, leaves for Iran to prospect for petroleum. And you actually went to the trouble of seeking out the origin of the story in Turkey, my dear son, at the end. I had no choice. With what result? I found. It was the wife not of a Swedish, but a German attaché, a blonde, somewhat cold beauty, who committed suicide in one of the cheapest hotels in Ankara for reasons unknown, just as I had suspected. And the uh, man who took her to the hotel? Unknown. Also, that same night, a preacher in a Turkish mission was severely beaten. His condition was far too grave to question him about the theft of the poor box. And the uh, conclusions you arrived at? It was too soon to come to a conclusion. Rather, I examined Mr. X's boredom. Oh, yes. Churchill's favorite book. Your second novel, truly a masterpiece. Mr. X. Once a good-for-nothing, uh, now a renowned author, uh, president of the American Pen Club, uh, meets a 16-year-old English girl in San Tropez. Enchanted by the child's beauty and natural grace, he succumbs to his primeval passions and... Uh, and murders the child during an incredibly violent thunderstorm. It is certainly the most enchanting as well as the most gruesome scene you've ever written. It has a fatalism that approaches ancient tragedy. My dear Sarah, at the end, don't be carried away by your powerful imagination. In 1957, ten years ago, a 16-year-old English girl was and murdered in San Tropez. Uh -huh. And the murderer? Unknown. Like the uh, murder of the German woman in Ankara. Precisely, in spite of the most thorough investigation. In spite of the investigation bogged down for the usual reason, no motive. Did you make any further discoveries? May I present you with a detailed list? A list? Of victims. Each one of these names corresponds to a character you created in one of your novels. Would you like to see it? You have 22 names. You have 22 novels to your credit, revered Mr. Crumb. That is correct. These people, uh, they are uh, dead. Priceless list. The result of 10 years patient investigation. May I point out a strange fact? Please do. Each accident, each suicide occurred in a place where you, revered Mr. Crumb, were present at the time. <laughs> Your sagacity is incredible. You've listed every one. And thrilled, my dear Saint at the end. Now, tell me, what have you found? Don't keep me in suspense. Well, we must consider all 22 murders as just one. Because all your heroes have the features of just one man. A powerful, lusty individual who goes charging across the pages of your novels as though he were on a galloping horse. Wildly enthusiastic, always a little drunk, and at the decisive moment of murder, his chest is always bare. Ah, yes, yes. Now tell me, um, what conclusions have you come to through your investigations? That you are the murderer. The golden age of television will continue in a moment. Tell me, if uh, I were to accept your theory, what would you want? Revered Mr. Crabb, may I speak to you in candid frankness? Oh. <laughs> Certainly. Allow me. Allow me, revered Mr. Crabb. Oh. To tell the truth, at first, I thought only of turning you over to the authorities. And you have changed your mind? I have. I have decided to relinquish the highest form of happiness, personal fame. Sit down. Thank you. Uh, the uh, pillow. Thank you. <clears throat> now, what do you expect of me in exchange? A small token of uh, appreciation. 
In what form? Be a small pension, uh, uh, six or seven hundred francs a month, perhaps, so that I can continue uh, in a discreet way, of course, to participate in your adventures. Uh, not only as an admirer, but as a secret accomplice. My dear saint Etienne, may I also be, uh, to use your expression, candidly frank. You are without a doubt the greatest detective I have ever met, I confess. You admit everything? Everything. You admit to 22 murders? 22. I believe this is the most solemn moment of my life. It is the most solemn moment of your life, though in a slightly different sense than you believe. In spite of your scientific approach, you have committed several decisive errors. Errors? Three to be exact. I can't believe it. I have proceeded with every possible care and caution. Has it occurred to you that it might be a dangerous thing to uh, confront me with the intimate knowledge of my private life? You mean that you might do away with me? Hmm? Of course, revered Mr. Crabb. Of course, such a possibility occurred to me. But here in this hotel, a cry for help would create a scandal that would be heard around the world. You would have to dispose of me in a completely silent fashion. Poison is the only possibility. Is that why uh, you refused the drink? Precisely. It wasn't easy. I simply adore alcoholic beverages. And refuse the cigar? In your third novel, the tenor Lawrence Hockman was destroyed by a particularly fine Havana cigar which had been treated with a lethal <laughs> Indian poison. <laughs> <laughs> My dear, set at the end. And now for your other miscalculations. First, you are forgetting we live in the year 1967, and second, that you are from Locust, and you are judging the world by Locust's provincial standards. Otherwise, you would have realized long ago the futility of your investigations. What do you mean? What you consider to be a secret known only to you <laughs> has been common knowledge a long time. That is impossible. Do you think the public would virtually devour my novels unless it knew I was describing murders I had actually committed? But if that were true, you would have been arrested long ago. <laughs> Why? Because you have murdered. Oh, mass. My dear son at the end, only a very small number of those who murder are ever brought to justice. The majority not only remain unpunished, but like myself, receive great honors. Think of your military, your judges, your public prosecutors, and your physicians. The same reason that prevented you from going to the authorities prevented them from arresting me. Admiration. Then I don't understand the world anymore. You don't understand the literary world. But a poet is the most sublime, the highest form of creation. In what ridiculous textbook did you read that drivel that poets are sublime? Nearly every poet through the ages has been considered something of a monster. Look at these. I received them by the hundreds. From ladies of the social register, middle class housewives, even servants. With the offer to do them in. This is a nightmare. I must be dreaming. Well, it's time you awakened. It is the author's fate in our times that he must lead an even more criminal existence to present his public with new thrills. The public doesn't yearn for a new form or uh, literary experiments. It yearns for, for beauty. It yearns for truth, for solutions to its eternal <laughs> problems. Nonsense. Nothing. Nothing must interfere with mankind's thirst for new thrills. I don't know. You don't know anything. <laughs> there isn't a court in the world that would listen to you. Because I am exactly what the public wants me to be, and you, you would be judged insane. Ah, oh, you're a fool, Sen at the end. You have wasted your savings in an incredibly stupid fashion. Now shout for help. For help? Hmm. I need a new subject. A subject? Yes, yes. I think I'll write a short play. Yes, yes. A uh, one-act play. What are you doing with that pistol? You, you still don't understand? I'm, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm leaving at once. But I didn't get this pistol for you to leave. 
You're going to die. I swear to you, I will leave it once you've been trying to... But you've given me an idea for a one-act play, and you must die. I swear to you, I will leave it once and return to Locust. But you must die. You see, I have no imagination at all. I, I can only write about things I've experienced. And through my efforts, you will become an immortal figure in the world of literature. Millions will see you as you stand before me now. Trembling, mouth slack, eyes open wide. Oh, cataracts of horror. Oh, yeah, I like that. I must use it, cataracts of horror. Oh! Don't be provincial. No one would dare interrupt me while I'm at work. You are Satan. I'm an author. And you must understand, old man, I'm doing this purely for financial reasons. Mercy, revered maestro. Mr. Crowd. Revered uh, Mr. Crab. The play I'm going to write about your murder will be translated into every language in the world. <laughs> May God have mercy on my soul. Oh, for those concerned with literature, there is no mercy. <laughs> Mr. Crab? Mr. Crab? Oh, oh, Mr. Crab, are you all right? Oh, good God, what happened? My visitor jumped from the balcony. He asked me for money, and when I refused, Frightening experience. Dear Mr. Crab, I am disconsolate. How did that man ever get in your room? He now lies crouched among the rose bushes. That man must have been insane. Thank goodness no one was injured when that maniac jumped. An incident. Uh, make sure that I'm not disturbed. Certainly, Mr. Crab, certainly. Uh, please accept my apologies for all the trouble. Thank you. And now to work, Sebastian. We shall work all night. Tomorrow we shall go to Mallorca. Mallorca? I'm in the mood for the Mediterranean. Ready? Ready. What I should like you to witness is a somewhat strange, but let me emphasize at once, true story. We all know that it is somewhat dangerous to present a true story. One never knows who might be in the audience. A policeman, for example, a public prosecutor, or perhaps even the custodian of the television code, yet not necessarily in an official capacity. Join us at the same time next week when the Golden Age of Television presents Hello, Charlie. Next, check into Amanda's for a hilarious half hour of comedy with Emmy winner B. Arthur. Next. Pardon me, folks. How do you like your new...